Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, before uh, Brother Stephen comes, and he really needs no introduction, uh, but this is a sacred desk. Amen. And uh, I don't take it lightly. Uh, I don't let just anyone preach in my pulpit who wants to. And uh, the best thing on all my young preacher <coughs> boys is from every church, listen, uh, watch someone. Uh, watch them for a long time. Now, I was trying to figure up, and uh, I hope I'm not correct. I hope I figured my year is wrong, but uh, I don't think I have. Um, uh, <clears throat> Brother Stephen told, uh, I think, uh, Brother Kenny that he is 37 now. And I got to thinking, that means I would have met Stephen when he was a teenager. Uh, he would have been 17, 18, 19, long in there. Man, that really made me feel old. Uh, <laughs> But, again, uh, I've watched him down through the years, and I will have to say this, I wasn't shocked by any means when the Lord led him to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, the first thing I remember about Stephen is how kind and helpful he was to Sister Elsie. Amen. Uh, I, I miss Amen. her a great deal. Amen. Uh, when I met Sister Elsie, and at that point... Her husband was still living too. Stephen would drive them to church. His granddaddy was very sick at that time. And he would help with her, him. And he would help with Sister Elsie. And as Sister Elsie became more and more frail, he uh, was more and more attentive. <coughs> and then he married one of my best friend's daughter. And I really had to keep eyes on him. And... Uh, I watched how he cared for Natalie, and Natalie, um, at least now to me, at that time I guess I didn't think of she was just a kid, and uh, he treated her just as the Bible uh, teaches us to, keep, to treat our wives, as Christ loved the church. And then uh, I had the pleasure to um, go to Mexico with him, and uh, we kind of got that trip together, and Brother Stephen came to me and he said, I'd really like to go. And I said, well, we, we, we'll make it happen. And we went down together. And he survived Birch driving. Uh, I knew it was predestined and foreordained for him to do something just by getting through that. Uh, but before we went to go to the mountains and uh, organize a church there in the mountains of Chetimal, uh Stephen prayed. And if anybody ever I seen myself get a hold of God, uh, it was that morning in front of Brother Kraft's home. And uh, again, I took note. And uh, I've learned to trust him down through the years. And another last thing I'm going to say is his willingness pretty much to do anything. I've seen him lead the sand. I've seen him sing specials, I've seen him play the organ, I've seen him play the piano, I've seen him lead singing, and that's a good quality in a man. Uh, you know, uh, don't ever be too good to push them off. I think sometimes as pastors, we think we're a, a little bit above that. Uh, that's certainly not what the Bible teaches. It's, and um, that was impressive to me. So Brother Stephen, you come and give us what the Lord's given you. I'll pay you after the service. <laughs> uh, I did not deserve that gracious uh, invitation, and it's a it's a blessing to me. It's a privilege to be able to be here with you tonight. I appreciate the invitation, my brother. Uh, Larry and the church, and uh, thank you for feeding us the food and the fellowship we, our family, enjoy. Tonight I would just want to start with uh, a question. We live in a time where uh, faith, if you ask someone in the world, what is faith? You might get an answer like this, faith is believing something for which there is no evidence. That's a common definition of faith in the world. My question to you, is that the biblical 
definition of things. Because that's the biblical view of faith, that we're just believing something with no evidence. No, not at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible teaches us that God has given manifold evidences of himself, of his truth, of his revelation, so that there need not be any doubt to people to receive his message. Amen. He's done that in a number of ways. Uh, there are many kinds of this evidence, if you look for them. There's the evidence just from nature itself and the design you see. Uh, there's evidence in uh, the great miracles that God worked. Uh, for instance, before the children of Israel, uh, think of all that that generation saw. And of course, the great miracle of the resurrection and the witnesses to that. We have great evidence when God works in our own heart. Amen. We experience. Amen. We have an experiential uh, knowledge of God. But there's a one particular kind of evidence we want to look at tonight. And that's the evidence of fulfilled prophecy. Mm -hmm. Fulfilled prophecy. That is one of God's grand ways of demonstrating Amen. His truth to us. Right. So that again, there can be no reasonable doubt that God is speaking and that we must listen. And again, this is not just an idea of man's philosophy. This is, a, this is in Scripture. Amen. Uh, it, particularly, if you look in the book of Isaiah, uh, from chapter 40 on, uh, you'll find many references like this. God says, Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you. Amen. Amen. Or he says, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none else. Right. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. Amen. Amen. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. Amen. I have purposed it. Amen. I will also do it. Amen. So God himself sets this before us as a Amen. great evidence of his uh, truth. And that, didn't, uh, that wasn't exclusively in the Old Testament. That's why we read in the New Testament things like, as it is written. Amen. Or that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet. And the scripture was fulfilled. How many times do you see that? Amen. Especially in the Gospels. Those who wrote those books had foremost in their mind that they were witnessing prophecy being fulfilled. Amen. And tonight, I just want to bring one particular prophecy that is uh, extraordinary, that God has fulfilled before all people. And that is the prophecy regarding the conversion of the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. The prophecy of the conversion of the Gentiles. Um, this is something that God began to reveal even very early. Uh, in Genesis, we read the Lord Jehovah speaking to Abraham. And he says, in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. Amen. So even in that early stage, God says that you're not just going to be a blessing in your own nation, but your seed is going to be a blessing to all nations. Amen. He goes further. This is interesting. Also in the, the Pentateuch, in Deuteronomy, uh, in the Song of Moses, the Lord says this. That's a kind of a cryptic remark that he makes. He says, speaking of Israel and kind of in view of their future apostasy, he says, they have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. Amen. And I, and I will move them to jealousy with those which are not a people. I will provoke them Amen. to anger with a foolish nation. So God, in a sense, says, uh, you've provoked me by worshiping that which is not God. I'm going to make you jealous by my dealings with a foolish nation. Amen. Amen. And this begins to be unfolded more and more in the Old Testament. In that, uh, in that famous Psalm 22, the one that the Lord Jesus uh, applied to himself as he was hanging on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Amen. That's the first line of Psalm 22. And it's in that Psalm that we see this 
miraculous description of the crucifixion. Uh, that was some centuries before crucifixion had even been invented right. as a method of execution. Uh, but it speaks uh, the most tellingly in verse 16. They pierced my hands and my feet. But even in the midst of this psalm, prophetic about the Lord, we read this in verse 27. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Amen. Amen. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Amen. So in connection with the suffering of this one that David sets forth, our Lord, there's also the promise that what he does is going to be effectual for all the nations of the world, not just Israel. We see a, we see a glimpse of this in Daniel chapter 7, yeah. in the vision of Daniel, when he sees the heavenly Son of Man come before the Ancient of Days. Uh, one of the things it says there is that there was given him dominion and glory and the kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Amen. Now we know that Jesus is the Son of Man. That's who it's speaking of. And you see this figure, the Son of Man, he is one like a Son of Man, and yet he is also coming in clouds. Amen. He is a God-man. And it's this one divine man that it says all nations are going to come to serve. Amen. And that's a special word. That means to worship as God. Amen. That's just like in earlier chapters of Daniel, it says we won't serve your God. That's the way that all nations are going to worship the Son of Man. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amazing. This is speaking about the, uh, the conversion of many nations. But I think we see the most, uh, the clearest the most explicit references in the Old Testament to the conversion of the Gentiles in the, uh, the book of Isaiah. Turn with me, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 49. We're just going to really scratch the surface of what God says to the prophet Isaiah about the conversion of the nations, the conversion of the Gentile people. In Isaiah chapter 49, Beginning in verse 5, we read, And now saith the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Amen. And he said, It is a like thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel, I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles, Amen. that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. Amen. This is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is uh, in Isaiah's uh, section regarding the servant, the servant of the Lord. And we're most familiar with that in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant of the Lord. It's that very servant that he says is going to be a light to the Gentiles. Amen. The means by which uh, God's salvation will be spread to all nations. You can see that as you get closer and closer to uh, chapter 53. Uh, turn over to Isaiah 52, kind of in the, the run up to that great chapter 53 of Isaiah. In Isaiah 52, verse 10, you see this mentioned. The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Amen. So there it is again. Mm -hmm. It says that God is working something in the sight of all nations. It's not hidden. It's not just tucked away in some Amen. backwater. This is done before the sight of all nations. Yeah. It's the one that the things, the things that this suffering servant are going to do, are going to be done before the sight of all nations. You even see that uh, later in chapter 52. Look at verse 15. It says just simply here, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Amen. That means 
What is the sprinkling speaking of? It's speaking about justification, cleansing, Amen. righteousness. Amen. Many nations are going to be made righteous through the suffering of this one. And how is that going to happen? Well, Isaiah tells us in the next chapter, By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. Amen. For he shall bear their iniquity. Amen. And uh, I assure you, we're just scratching the surface about what Isaiah says regarding the Gentiles. You're right. But here's something that we often lose sight of, and I just want us to meditate on for a moment. Think about the great natural improbability of the conversion of the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. How unlikely it would be for the Gentiles ever to turn to the Lord. Right. This is truly what might be called a risky prediction. Yeah, man. You know, if I predicted that, you know, the sky is going to be blue a year from now, that wouldn't be much, would it? But if I said the, the sky is going to turn green, it's going to stay that way in one year, that would be a real risky prediction. Right. That's the kind of prediction here. This is not something that happens by nature. Amen. The Gentiles turning to the Lord. We've read a few mentions of the nations and the Gentiles, but if you've read the Old Testament, you know the vast majority of references to the Gentiles uh, do not refer to blessing, but they refer to judgment. Amen. And that in the Jewish mind was the place of the Gentiles. They were, uh, they were just the fuel for the fire of God's judgment. With just a handful of exceptions, the only people on the face of the earth before the first century who ever worshipped the true God were Jews. Mm -hmm. After all the nations of men scattered at Babel, God had only dealt in a special way with a very few. Mm -hmm. His chosen people. Mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the twelve tribes of Israel, and their descendants. As God worked particularly in the nation of Israel, what were the rest of the nations doing? Mm -hmm. The Egyptians, the Canaanites, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, right. the Greeks and the Romans, what were they doing? Every one of those heathen nations was involved in rank idolatry. Amen. Worshipping wood, stone, and gold, yeah. the works of men's hands. That's it. Yeah. Those nations were mired in depraved immorality. That's right. Guilty of unspeakable fornication, abusers of mankind, women, mm -hmm. and even of children, mm -hmm. offering human sacrifices, very often their own infants, right. revelers, drunkards, and drug abusers, oppressors of their own countrymen who were poor. They were insatiable, bloodthirsty conquerors and inventors of cruel tortures for their enemies. Right. And on every occasion, those Gentile nations fiercely persecuted the Jews. When they weren't putting them to tribute, they were murdering them and enslaving those who survived. That's what the Gentiles were. Mm -hmm. And so it was in every corner of the world, whether you looked at Europe or Africa or Asia or the Americas. Right. Every Gentile nation was in utter spiritual blindness and darkness. Amen. Aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. Right. And strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Mm -hmm. And yet David prophesies, all the ends of the world shall remember Amen. and turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. This is perhaps the most improbable, the most implausible, the most incredible and unbelievable prediction that could have been made that all the barbarous heathen right. nations in the world would one day come to worship the one true God, Amen. the God of Israel. For the Jews, it was surely unthinkable that the defiled Gentiles who everywhere so hated them would ever bow the knee to Jehovah. Amen. 
and it would have been equally unthinkable for those Gentiles themselves that they would ever throw away their cherished idols, the gods of their fathers, and all that they'd ever known, and worship alongside of Jews. And it's right in the midst of this impossibility that Jesus was born. Amen. Jesus was born. Turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. These promises have been made. In Luke, chapter 2, we begin to see this in connection with our Lord Jesus. Luke, chapter 2, let's begin reading in verse 25. Jesus has been uh, born a virgin, and now they're taking him into the temple to present him to the Lord. And in verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Amen. And the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Yeah. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace Amen. according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Amen. It was revealed to Simeon Amen. in those early days that this babe was the light to the Gentiles. Amen. No doubt people didn't fully understand what Simeon was referring to when he said this. But this was only the beginning. You see, because Jesus himself made the conversion of the Gentiles one of the foremost themes of his ministry. Mm -hmm. Oh, we lose sight of that. We don't see it. It's We see it here and there, but put it together. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he's always making these comments about Gentiles. And he's always intersecting with the lives of Gentiles. And right. he's healing them. And he's saving them. That was no accident. Amen. Jesus is the manifestation of these Old Testament prophecies. And they're beginning to come to pass. Yeah. You're in Luke. Turn to the fourth chapter. Luke chapter 4. Uh, Jesus, after he had been uh, baptized. And after he had been tempted. He was then returned back to Galilee, and he came back to Nazareth. And he went into this synagogue, and uh, they asked him to read. And he turned over to Isaiah, and he read from Isaiah, and he sat down, and in uh, verse 21, let's just pick it up here, and he began to say unto them, this day, is this scripture fulfilled in your ears? Amen. And all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? In other words, they did not accept right. what Jesus was saying. They did not believe that he was the fulfillment of these prophecies. They said, Wait a second, you're Joseph's son. We, we've known you. And then Jesus says this, verse 23, And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard, done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. In a sense, he expected them to say, Well, if you really want us to receive you, do some miracles and we'll right. believe. But verse 24, And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. Listen to this. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, that is, Elijah. And the heaven was shut up three years and six months when great famine was throughout all the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save to Sarepta, a city of Zion, 
and to a woman that was a widow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus saying, there were many widows in Israel, but who was it that Elijah was sent through? The Gentile. That's right. Mm -hmm. And he also says this, verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, or Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman, the Syrian. Right. Another Gentile. <coughs> and uh, you see, Jesus has here been rejected by his own people. And he makes reference, well, there are some who have been blessed mm -hmm. by Elijah and Elisha, and they were, they were Gentiles. Mm -hmm. The people there in the synagogue could read between the lines. <laughs> they knew what he was saying. Amen. Yeah. In verse 28, and all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. Right. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Amen. They were going to kill him. Right. Because he had the audacity to point out. I mean, what he said was true, wasn't it? Amen. If they knew the Old Testament, they couldn't deny that what he was saying was right. But it was the context that he used that that defended them. Right. As if he was going to bless the Gentiles. It was, uh, it was around this time, early in Jesus' ministry. We won't turn there, but you remember he was traveling back to Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Amen. He must needs go through Samaria. Good. Good. And you remember, he encountered the woman there at the well at Sychar, and he ministered to her, and she, she believed. She Amen. was saved. Amen. And then all the, the men there, they listened, and they heard and uh, they turned to the Lord and believed. And they said this in uh, John 4, 42. Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this in indeed is the Christ. The Amen. Amen. The Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, that, that phrase to them, those Samaritans, the Savior of the world, was, was dear. Uh, of course, we know he's not speaking of every individual in the world without exception. But he is the savior of the Jew and the Gentile. Amen. The savior of even the Samaritan. Amen. He's the savior of the world. Amen. And they believed on him. Yeah. But it seems like most of the other Jews rejected him. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, uh, on another occasion. You remember that Jesus healed the servant of a centurion, a Roman centurion. And uh, what was it the centurion said? He said, you don't even have to come to my house. Right. Just say the word and you'll be Amen. Yeah. And uh, when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him and turned him about and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. Amen. No, not in Israel. You're right. He Amen. commended the faith of this Gentile. He used him as an example. It was a rebuke. Amen. Him. But this Gentile was another example of those who had faith in him. Uh, Jesus went on to teach the, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And who was the hero of that story? It wasn't the, the priest or the Levite. It was the Samaritan. And uh, then he, he made this statement. Turn to Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11. Uh, he's teaching the people. And in verse 29 in Luke 11, it says, And when the people were gathered thick together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. They seek a sign. Right. And there shall no sign be given to it, but the sign of Jonas the prophet. For as Jonas was a sign unto the Ninevites, so shall also the Son of Man be to this generation. Amen. And you remember, the Ninevites, they were notorious Gentiles. Look at verse 31. The queen of the south, that is the queen of Sheba, mm -hmm. shall rise up in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, greater than Solomon is here. Amen. He says... This Gentile queen is going to judge this generation. She's going to rise up in judgment against them. He says, verse 32, the men of Nineveh 
shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here. Amen. Again, he's using these examples of the Gentiles in the Old Testament to point to the truth that uh, they're going to receive me. Nevertheless, this generation of Jews are rejecting him. Amen. This sign of Jonas sign of the prophet Jonah. That's interesting. Of course, in Matthew, we know he says that uh, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of uh, in the whale belly, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Uh, that's not really even recorded here. That's a good part of the sign of Jonas. What he's pointing out is that the career of Jonah is going to have these profound parallels with his own career, mm -hmm. the Son of Man. What was it that Jonah did? Well, you remember, he was swallowed by that whale, and he, uh, but then he came up. He was vomited up on the land, and then he went and preached to the Gentiles. That's it. Now, uh, where do you think that Jonah, Jonah stayed alive those three days and nights in the whale, or whether you, I believe it's a possibility that he was dead, and that God raised him from the dead and caused him to preach to the uh, Ninevites, whether it was either position you take, you can see even in symbolism, it's there. It's as if he's the resurrected prophet to the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what happened to our Lord Jesus. After his resurrection, he was preached and believed on among the Gentiles. Amen. And this was a great sign before the, the face of that generation. Around the same time, Jesus cast out a devil from the daughter of a Syrophoenician woman. Mm -hmm. That is a, a woman of Canaan. And she demonstrated great faith. She wouldn't, she wouldn't leave. Wouldn't leave until Jesus had cast out the, the devil. Mm -hmm. And then over in John again, Jesus makes this statement. He's teaching about how he is the, the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He just makes this statement. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Right. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Amen. Amen. Right. Now look over here in Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. This is the uh, this is the tragic part about how the Gentiles came to be converted was that it happened in tandem with the fall of the Jews. Right. It was a great tragedy that the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus, their long-expected Messiah. They did not receive him, so great judgment fell upon them. And Jesus is, is even making reference to this in Luke chapter 13, verse 28. He says, There shall be weeping, and gnashing of teeth, when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. Right. And they shall come from the east and from the west Amen. and from the north and from the south Amen. and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus said it's going to be a tragic day when you see multitudes of Gentiles who never knew the truth come and sit down in the kingdom of God and you who should have known better than anyone thrust out. That's going to be great yeah. weeping and gnashing of teeth. Not only will there be this great eschatological tragedy in the end of the world, in the, in the final judgment, they're going to be uh, they're going to be under the condemnation of God, but there was a judgment that fell even at that time. Right. Amen. And that is when the Romans in 7 right. AD destroyed Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a terrible cataclysmic event. We lose sight of how critical a historical event that was because Amen. it's not directly recorded in the scriptures. But Jesus all the time making references to it. Yes. And uh, I think we have... We have uh, the first-hand account of Josephus that tells Amen. us exactly the things that, that happened there. 
even before, uh, that, that happened, as I said, in 70 AD, some four decades after uh, the Lord was crucified. But even before he went to the cross, he's warning them and telling them and warning them. Amen. Later in this chapter, verse 34, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together uh, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings. And ye would not. That's it. Behold, your house is left on you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not see me until the time shall come when you shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And it's this theme of judgment that's uh, juxtaposed with the conversion of the Gentiles in some of Jesus' teaching from this point on. Here, if you see uh, in the next chapter, chapter 14, we pick it up in verse 15. This is the parable of the great banquet. Jesus is speaking about the very same things we've just been speaking about. Luke 14, 15. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper, and bade me, he invited me to come, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. Right. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of ground, I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed uh -huh. and the halt and the blind. Yeah. That's you and me, brother. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were blind. Mm -hmm. You know what? We weren't even on the first guest list. Yeah. It's, uh, we know that our names were written down yeah. before the foundation of the world. But he came here first to his people. Yeah. It's, it's, it's in a sense that we, we didn't even belong here. But he called us in. Yeah. Amen. He purposed to call us in. And this is... A touching scene that happens next, verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there's room. Mm -hmm. There's still room. It's not going to be a small number who are brought in. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. Amen. Amen. He purposes that there'll be a great multitude at this feast. But again, it's tinged with this sorrow of judgment on the Jews because he says, verse 24, for I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Right. Amen. Amen. Actually, in Matthew's account of this same parable, it says, when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Amen. Of course, we know from Josephus that is precisely what happened. They burned the temple. In fact, they dug up the temple and the city to the foundations. A few chapters later in Luke, you remember Jesus healed ten lepers. But nine of them just ran on and only one of them returned to, to give thanks and to give glory to God. And uh, Jesus said, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. Mm -hmm. He was a Samaritan. It was only the Samaritan who turned to give God glory. Here we see in Luke chapter 19, turn here. Again, the Lord Jesus is weeping over the city of Jerusalem. Because he knows. He knows the great strength that they're going to be in. And the right. And the seed. Verse 41, Luke 19. And when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept, saying, If thou hadst known, 
even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong to thy peace. But now they are hid from my eyes. Right. Jesus said, this belongs to you. This is your birthright. Mm -hmm. Amen. But you can't see it. And he grieved. Amen. And verse 43, for the day shall come upon thee that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee. That is a, a siege wall. Mm -hmm. And compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee. Mm -hmm. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Amen. Uh, again, he was grieved that this was going to be the fate of the, the Jews. But again, in the midst of all this, there's his message that the banquet is not going to be uneaten, but it's going to be it's going to be uh, it's going to be partaken of by a great multitude. There's another parable right here in the next chapter. You see, these things are all connected. Luke chapter twenty, verse nine. This is the parable of the wicked husband. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen, that is, vine dressers, who would, who would take care of it. And he went into a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away. Then again, he sent another servant. And they beat him also, and entreated him shamefully, and sent him away empty. And again he sent a third, and they wounded him also, and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Mm -hmm. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. Right. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He asked them, what do you think? Verse 16, he shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. Amen. He's going to give it to others. And that, the vineyard is not going to go untended. Yeah. He's going to give it to others. And what is he speaking of? He's speaking of the, the, that generation of Jews who uh, should have rendered God his fruits, both in times past when the prophets were sent to them, and finally here when Christ has come. But they would not. All they could do is take the son out of the vineyard and kill him. Mm. Which is exactly what they did. Right. Amen. Uh, he goes on, and they said, and they said, God forbid that this vineyard may ever be taken away from us. And he beheld them and said, What is this thing that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corn. Right. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind into powder. Mm -hmm. What he's saying there is that I am that stone that the builders rejected. These things too were prophesied mm -hmm. that our Lord would be rejected. Mm -hmm. But he said, that stone is going to fall in judgment and it's going to grind. And uh, the next verse, the chief priests and scribes at the same hour sought to lay hands on him, and they feared the people, for they perceived rightly that he had spoken this parable against them. And uh, we see more reference to this in the Olivet Discourse in the next chapter. Just read a, a few verses here in Luke 21, verse 20. Jesus is, uh, Jesus is predicting this destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, now, whether he has anything in mind other than just 70 AD, uh, I'll not address. But uh, we can see certainly he does have that in mind here because listen to what he says. Verse 20, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, 
Then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Mm -hmm. Then let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter therein too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Now you see this about uh, don't go into the city. Jesus is giving a warning to anyone who will listen. <coughs> because if there was an invading army, the natural thing, the common plan of action is to go to the, the nearest walled city, the ones with the, the highest walls, and tuck it out. And he said, don't go into the city. You'll go out into the country. Mm -hmm. Or you'll be destroyed. Anyone who took Jesus' advice here survived. Yeah. But verse 23, but woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, mm -hmm. and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly what happened. Uh, if you see in the records of Josephus, he said, uh, of course, a million Jews likely died in the siege of Jerusalem, but uh, another 100,000 were taken away captive, mm -hmm. and, and they were sent to every corner of the empire. It came to pass to the letter as Jesus had predicted. And he makes this uh, statement. He says, from that time on, Jerusalem is going to be trodden underfoot by the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And you know what? That came to pass. Mm -hmm. From that time on, the Jews had been expelled. Their temple was destroyed. They'd been wandering. That's when we call the great diaspora. Because right. They were dispersed. They did go into all nations. Now, it is interesting that in recent times, they've returned to the land. Right. Mm -hmm. It says that, that the Jerusalem has been trodden down the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles fulfilled. And you know what? It was trodden down by the Gentiles all the way until 1967. Yeah. The Six Day War. Mm -hmm. The Jews uh, seized East Jerusalem, and now it's no longer trodden under the foot of the Gentiles. Amen. Are we nearing the end of the times of the Gentiles? It may be. It may be. We don't have time to explore that further. Um, but Jesus, over and over, refers to those who are going to be converted. Uh, just as a few more examples. You remember when Jesus was nearing the cross, he was in Bethany, and a woman came in and anointed him. And they said, well, why is she wasting all this? Jesus said, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, this shall all, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told for a memorial. Amen. And that has come to pass. Amen. But you see, right in the midst of that, what is it that Jesus affirmed? This gospel shall be preached in the whole world. Amen. Amen. He said, This gospel is not just going to be a local phenomenon, it's going to go into the whole world. And then finally there, as Jesus was uh, on the cross, he gave up the ghost. And there were very few who understood the significance of what was going on at that time on the cross. But it was a Roman centurion who stood over against him and said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Amen. That Gentile understood. Mm -hmm. And then we come to, of course, the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. For as he says in Mark, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. Here even in Luke, he said, thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And he affirmed that again in, in Acts. Amen. Right before his ascension, he said, Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in both, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Amen. We've, we've, we've seen. This is no minor theme in the ministry of Jesus, is it? Jesus go, goes right in the line of these Old Testament prophecies, and he even puts further undeniable emphasis. He says, these Gentiles are going to turn, and they're not only going to turn to the true God, they're going to turn to the true God by me. Amen. Amen. It was a grand claim. But think about this. Even at the time of his ascension, Jesus' commission to his church is almost inconceivable mm -hmm. that through this small group of Jewish believers, all the heathen nations of the world would come to faith in Christ and become worshipers of the God of Israel. And at this time, the number of the names of the disciples together were only about 120. Right. How could this ever happen? But just then, a great miracle began to occur. 3,000 Jews were saved and Amen. headed to the church on the day of Pentecost. Another 5,000 Jews were saved only a short time later when Peter preached at the temple. Philip the Evangelist then went to Samaria, and many Samaritans were saved and baptized. Amen. Peter was called to preach to a Roman centurion named Cornelius. And uh, he and his friends and his family you know, were all saved, mm -hmm. received Amen. the Holy Ghost, and were baptized. And of course, that infamous persecutor, Saul of Tarsus, was converted on the road to Damascus. Amen. And was specially commissioned by Christ himself to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Amen. As uh, Jesus told Paul to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light. From the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in him. And for the rest of his life, Paul faithfully carried out this commission. Amen. By the time Paul was martyred in the 60s AD, there were churches not only in Jerusalem, but also in Judea and Samaria and Galilee, also in Syria, such as the Church of Antioch, mm -hmm. uh, also throughout Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, mm -hmm. and Ephesus, and Colossae, and Laodicea, and throughout the region of Galatia. There were churches in Greece, at Philippi, and Thessalonica, and Corinth. There was even a church on the island of Crete. Mm -hmm. There was a church as far west as Italy, mm -hmm. Amen. most notably that church at Rome. Paul had intended to even go farther west to Spain. Yeah. Uh, as far as we know, he never had the opportunity. We don't know. Churches went on to be established throughout the Roman Empire and then throughout the rest of Europe. The New Testament writings began to be copied and mm -hmm. widely distributed. Amen. The entire Bible was translated into Latin and to other languages. The Bible went on to become the most translated, the most widely printed, the most widely read book of all time. Amen. The complete text of the Bible is now <coughs> in over 600 languages. Faithful churches have preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ since that time, and they have sent their missionaries into every corner of the world. Today, over 2 billion people, nearly all of them Gentiles, at the very least, name the name of Christ. Amen. This one man, Jesus of Nazareth, Amen. changed the entire course of human history. Amen. 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 This is the year 2021, but that's only significant as Anno Domini, the year of our Lord. Amen. Right. Amen. It's impossible to fully appreciate the impact of the Bible and Christianity on all of human civilization as we know it today. Amen. The history of Europe was steeped in the Bible and in Christ for Amen. over a thousand years. Events that we take for granted, like the scientific revolution or the colonization of the New World, happened for explicitly Christian reasons. Amen. The history of our own country Amen. cannot be understood apart from the Bible. Mm -hmm. and Christianity. 
Beloved, the very fact that we Gentiles are here tonight is a miracle. Amen. 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 And it's proof positive that Jesus is the one he claimed to be. Amen. He is the long-expected Messiah. Amen. He is the heavenly Son of Man. He is the suffering servant who is now exalted by God. By God. He's the Savior of the world. Amen. Amen. The astounding prediction of the Old Testament and of Christ himself against all probability have come through. In that. In the seed of Abraham, all nations of the world have been blessed. Amen. All the ends of the world have remembered and have turned to the Lord. All the kindreds of the nations are worshiping before him. There are people from all people, nations, and languages who worship the God-man, Jesus Christ. Amen. All the ends of the world have seen the salvation of our God. He has sprinkled many nations. And they shall come That's right. from the east and mm -hmm. from the west mm -hmm. and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And, and, and in a sense, we're already seated there. Or in Ephesians 2, 6, we are now seated together in heavenly places. Amen. In Christ Jesus. Amen. Think about where we would be if God had not opened the door of faith to the Right. Mm. At that time, we were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, we who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. Now, therefore, we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Amen. Amen. It was prophesied in Isaiah that in him shall the Gentiles trust. Mm. Now my question to you is this. Do you trust him? Mm -hmm. Can there be any reasonable doubt about who Jesus is? There cannot. Uh, Jesus has uh, clearly and fully and finally authenticated himself to all men. It is for us to trust in him and to believe in him. Uh, Paul said, God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Amen. And that's what we call upon you to do. Any who are here without Christ, turn to him. Turn to the Lord. Rest in what he's done. Yeah. He's promised, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Amen. If you haven't trusted on Christ, I'll just leave you with this thought. Meditate on this. Are you satisfied with what God has done in Christ to save Gentile sins? Are you satisfied with it? Are you satisfied? I hope that you'll, you'll answer yes. Mm -hmm. And if you are satisfied, then rest in it. Amen. Trust in it. Thank you for your attention. Amen. 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 Amen.